Uh, firstly, I would like to appreciate uh, your attendance. I, I think today we'll be looking at the outline of the research proposal. The institution also gave you, I, I think I managed to get a certain document which talks about the outline here last year, where it gives you the, the over, overall outline of the research proposal. Remember that, guys, um, I'm going to talk about that uh, sooner, but what I want to say to you and, uh, and introduce myself, my name is Welcome Kupela. I am an accolade facilitator. Basically, my role is not to take the role of your supervisors, but to supplement. So I, I'll, I'll assist you with all your research-related uh, aspects, whether it could be your research proposal, whether it could be your research for your owners if you are doing that, or maybe your research for masters or your PhD. So what I do, I always uh, give another view in, res in respect to, to your submission and so on. That's why what we have here, we do have the overall workshop like this one, which are, they are going to carry until somewhere next year, October, November, all right? So we, we, we started them up. There are a lot of things I normally cover with my students. Um, not only the, 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 the research proposal or the research writing itself, there are other elements which I bring in so that you should be a more informed postgraduate student, all right? So, Today, we'll be looking more and more on the outline all right, of research proposal. One thing which I want to uh, indicate is that the outline I'm talking about in regards to the research proposal, it also depends on the, uh, on the college. It also depends on the departments, all right? I'm coming from the, from, from the education college. So most of my example are more uh, going to be uh, in regards to education and so on. Because that's my field. Uh, some of you are coming from law. Some of you are coming for economics and so on. So the outline won't be the same. And the other thing which I want to put in, in uh, to you guys before I go to to all the aspects on slide one is that there is a document which is available uh, uh, for students who are doing their masters and their doctorate. If you are doing your masters and your doctorate, I think it's especially if you are already doing your your doctorate, you should be familiar with the, with the with this um, document, and they call it the College uh, uh, Research Focus Areas. Each and every college, it has its own research focus. So when you do your, your research or your proposal, you need to align it to that research area, all right? They give it to you as a document. In, in College of Education, there are lots of departments around that, so you need to choose which one you want to align with. But basically what I was trying to say is that each and every college, it has its own research focus area document. So when you develop your, 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 your research proposal for your master's or your PhD, you need to align it with that, all right? And th those who are doing their honors, definitely you are submitting a portfolio. Let's say it's an honors, uh, you also have to do the research component, you submit a portfolio, and that portfolio got some elements which you are you need to work on. Then after, the, most of the time, you stagger up those elements. They may ask you in the portfolio to say, maybe the first assignment, it has to do with literature review. So you work on your literature review, you submit it, then they correct it, then you 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 you, you try to also to, to filter in the correction and going forward. But at the end, you submit it as a as a final re research um, um, uh, POE, where, which includes all the elements of the research proposal. It also goes hand in hand with the different colleges and so on. All right, but I'm talking about I think also of you who are doing psychology. If I'm not mistaken, it, those are the people whom I'm talking about for now. All right, but before we can start. All right, uh, someone is asking me about the reference guide. We'll talk about that. But before we start, guys, uh, as I've introduced myself, my name is Welcome Kubega. I'm an accurate facilitator, and I'm based at the Kuruluini uh, uh, Learning Center. So I'm based there. But now because we're, we're, we're working on, or, or, uh, online, so we're able to chat to touch various students who are not even associated with the Kuruluini Learning Center. So today we talk about only the outline. And this outline, I'm not going to talk about them in detail. You know, I'm going to touch in most all of the uh, of the art, all right? But briefly, most of the time, because as we are progressing with um, the workshops going forward, starting from workshop two, we are trying to break down 
this aspect in detail. All right, this out, outline process or this online document in detail now. That's why when I talk about eth sorry, when I'll be talking about the workshop of ethics, I'll be talking about ethics in, in a broader aspect. But now I'm not going to talk about ethics in a broader aspect. All right, we just give the, a brief um, explanation of the aspects. As we go on, if you're going to talk about quantitative methods, we are going to talk about it in detail. Also, when you talk, talk about quantity, uh, analyzing quantitative data and developing the quantitative instruments, we are going to talk about that in detail, all right, in some of the workshops, because I can't talk about everything in details in one workshop. Uh, <clears throat> the outcomes of today, it's only one outcome basically. I want us to understand on how the respective sections of the research proposal fits together, all right? The reason why I'm, I'm using the word fit or fits together. Uh, for example, there's, there's a metaphor which I will share with my students, uh, the metaphor of an onion. You know, uh, when you look at an onion, when you peel the onion, you don't start to peel the, the onion in the inner in inner part. You peel it from the outer, uh, uh, from the outside, all right? And gradually you are going to the inner and so on. As the layers have been peeled out, you end up being um, uh, approaching the inner part of the onion. The same thing with the research, all right? You cannot start by collecting your data or analyzing your data. You need to start somewhere. You need to tell us about your, your title. You need to tell us about the, your aims and objectives. You need to tell us about the, the, uh, the background of your, of your research or your study. You need to tell us about the problem statement and so on until you come to a section where you start to, to collect and then analyze the data and interpret the data. Then you write your research report. Can you see? That's why that's why I'm told, I'm talking about the fits together. In other words, all these components they know they work together. All right. And and the other thing about these components, there are times you cannot start with the last component. For example, you cannot just now to say I'm writing my research. Then you have a research title. Then tomorrow you say uh, you you're applying for research ethics. It doesn't work like that. We need to make sure that you develop your research proposal, and when it is expect, accepted by your, your your supervisor, the supervisor will now encourage you to apply for the research ethics. So all these aspects they follow each other. But please, even though I say this aspect they follow each other, it, we 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 don't stop you. If you want to start to to maybe to write about ethics now, even though you have not written a proper statement. We don't stop you to do that, all right? You can do that. But at the end, when you present the document itself, these components, they must fit together. They need to follow each other. They should be a coherent in your research proposal. But I want us to spend only one minute on this one again. Maybe let's see our understanding regarding all these aspects, all right? The first one, I want you to, to tell me, what do you understand by this com uh, concept called research proposal? And the other aspect, why do we need to do a research proposal? Why is it so important? Uh, Christy, you are saying, you believe that a research proposal guides and clarifies our ideas, right? It guides and also clarifies our ideas, right? I'll talk about that also. And both of you are saying the research proposal is a proposal, it's a proposed plan for intended research. It's a proposed plan. It's a proposed plan, all right, for that intended research work. Okay, let's hear Andrew. You say a research is there to provide a guide, a roadmap. Roadmap of the research idea or topic, right? I think the, the key phrase there is a roadmap, eh? is it? To obtain approval from the university to continue with the research idea, all right? To develop it to so that you can get an approval. Get an approval. Cindy, you're saying a research proposal gives your supervisor an idea of the area of research you plan to tackle. All right. In other words, it also assists the, the supervisor to be to have an idea about your research process. It is important because they can guide 
you on whether you are on the right track or not. I also agree with that one. I think um, uh, Chipo, you are saying research proposal outlines what what you want to research. All right, interesting. Kofri also says it's important to narrow down the focus of the research and for the supervisor to understand what the students planning to do so that they can assist and guide. In other words, assist, it also help you to engage with the supervisor where they could also assist you and guide you. I agree also with that one. It shows intention for the specific projects, yes. Uh, that someone is saying a research proposal is a structured formal document, structured, and also a formal document. All right, I, I, I've just picked some of the important concepts from other students. I'm not saying the others which I'm not going to refer to are not important, also important, I agree with you guys. But someone uh, sp spoke about being a guide and also it classifies the idea, all right? So think about if um, you, 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 there is a tender, all right, which is uh, being advertised and you are supposed to submit a certain amount of money, let's say, for example, 2,000 rents, in order to, to fall in that process of the tendership, all right? What you normally do, they will invite you as a group, then they will brief you about the tender, then after that, you have to pitch your own tender, all right? So in other words, you say to yourself, based on the tender, I'll be able to do APC. Then you, you, you complete all those documents. By pitching that tender, in other words, you are saying to the people who are, uh, um, they want to give you a tender or who have a work to be done, you are saying to them, please take me because my work is going to be the best work and I'm going to do my work in this way and that way and also got an experience of doing this and that. So you are, the, you are pitching, you, you are proposing to say, here I am. I've got this expertise, I've got these skills, then I'll be able to do the work as required. The same thing with the research proposal. We are pitching there to say, look, supervisors, you have this focus area, all right, which you, you, you want students to, to, to work on, and already you are my supervisor. You want two students, I'm number one of those students. So I'm going to put my ideas forward. Here are my ideas. Listen to my ideas. All right. So remember that, guys, when you pitch your research proposal, the, 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 the people who are going to look at your research proposal are not interested in other things. They are more interested on how you are going to undertake your research. Nothing else. They don't even care whether you, are a, you, you have so many cats, so many dogs and so on. They want the document to talk to your idea. So that's why a research proposal is very important. Because if you submit a research proposal which does not convince them, they are not going to listen to you. So it is also a, a roadmap, all right? It, it gives you a direction to say, you are going to start from this point up to that point until you complete your research report, all right? That's why I always use the, way, uh, the other way to which I also use, I call it a, 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 a blueprint, you know? All right. I know that sometimes if you talk about blueprint, we normally talk about it if you talk about curriculum. To say curriculum of a school, it's a blueprint. And sometimes when they classify it, they say if it's a blueprint, in other ways, you are not going to change anything. You have to follow it the way it is. But in regards to research proposal, it is your blueprint. It is your roadmap. It is your idea. It is something which you say, here I am. Can you please allow me and give me an opportunity to do this research, this research? And especially if there are funding involved, but it was remember that I've seen with the College of Education, most of the focus areas where they will say there's a focus area in inclusivity and so on, already they will say they want two or three, let's say they will say two students for masters. Already there's a funding around that. You may find that you're going to also to be funded, all right? So if someone is going to find you, it means your idea, it must be there in order to solve a certain problem. That's why a research proposal is so important. And I'm telling you, if you have developed your research proposal so well, and listen to, to me, uh, to me, guys, I'm not saying, especially in your, in, in, in your honors, when you develop your research proposal and you also go and develop a research proposal to be admitted for your master's degree, already you have written a chapter one of your, your dissertation. But if I'm, I'm saying that the research proposal, it forms your chapter one, it doesn't mean that when you start to write your research report, 
then you take your research proposal the way it is, then you put it as chapter one. No, you have to modify it because remember that a research proposal, most of the time it's an intention. It's something which you, you want to do, all right? So because it's an intention, it's not in the current tense, all right? It's more on the future tense, all right? So when you write your research report, now you are reporting on something which you have done. That's why most of the time we say write it on current uh, tense or maybe write it on a past tense because you have already done it. So that's why I'm saying, if I'm saying to you, your, your research proposal definitely is your chapter one. It means you have to look at the tenses there around the, your research proposal. I mean, your, your chapter one, when you take your research proposal as your chapter, the one. So you need to also to work around the, the tenses. Or oh, why it's important? I think I've mentioned some of the aspects. Other colleagues they are saying um, it is also uh, a formal document. It's a structured one. Please make sure that you underline this word structure and also formal. Research writing, it's a formal structure. It's a formal way of writing and structured. In ours, there's a structure. There's terminology you cannot use in your research proposal. Every research proposal and research writing, there are specific terminology which we use. We don't write as if you are writing for a, for, for a newspaper where you, you are freelancing and so on. There is a structure which is involved around that. That's why when you start to write your document, those of you who have started with your master's and your PhD, I think those who are doing their PhD already know. Sometimes you submit one chapter for four times and sometimes even five times. All right. As long as the supervisor is not super happy with your chapter, you are going to resubmit. You're going to correct, resubmit, correct, resubmit. That's why we need a certain formality and a certain structure in your document. And someone is speaking about getting an approval. Definitely agree with you. The research proposal is needed there also so that you get an approval from the institution to do research and also can use it for the approval of the um, um, of receiving an ethical clearance from the, the from the institution itself. Remember that you cannot go and collect data from anyone else if you are not being given a permission by the institution, which is UNISA. In other words, you need to get an ethical clearance uh, number to go and collect data. That's how it works. Because when you go and collect data in some of the, of, of, of the setups, they will say, all right, we see. We are saying to us, you have to collect data. Where is the proof around that? Then you prove, we produce the document from the institution itself. If, for example, it's within the College of Education, you need also to get permission from the Houghton Department of Education. Or if you are at Mpumalanga, you need to apply for, for a permission to conduct research in schools from the Mpumalanga Department of Education. So that's how it works. You have been given that permission. Otherwise, if you don't have permission, you are not going to, to conduct any research. I think I've, I've also spoken about why is it so important to see one colleague is saying something. Uh, we are saying that um, LT, you are saying necessary to convince the relevant stakeholders about the project or research. I agree with that one. I've mentioned that one also. You, can, you want to convince them. All right. Remember that sometimes when you do your research proposal, like I've said, you may find that it's been funded. So if it's, it's been funded, you're going to get a certain amount of money as a student there when you're doing that type of research. So you need to convince the institution to say your research is going to add value. Please underline that. I want my students' research to add value. I don't want my student to say, to go and brag and say, I got a master's degree in what and what, but you're not adding value, all right? You may find that maybe your document or your thesis or your dissertation is sitting there at the, at the library. No one is even reading it. So your work should be read, and not only by the South African students and so on. It needs to be read internationally. That's why we talk about structure here. Remember that the document you are going to come up with, whether it's an honors, and if I can tell you guys, those who are doing honors, I always say to my students, you can start to publish from your honors work. It's possible, all right? You can publish. 
Your masters can also publish. Your PhD can publish. And remember that if you are going to have that final dissertation or dissertation for your masters or your, your PhD, it's going to be stored within the institution, and anyone can access it, even the international community. So that's why we talk about this document to be coherent and need to be structured. All right. That's why we check small things, colleagues. We, we also check some small things like spelling. Someone who says spelling doesn't matter. It does matter. Because remember, you're not writing this document for you. You are writing this document for, 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 for the broader audience. If they see your document not being checked in regard to spelling, what does it say to the institution? It says a lot. Let, let alone the student. Everything becomes focused to the institution and also to the supervisor. So that's why we say everything should be current. It should be well written. Just need to move a little bit now. I want us to quickly look at the outline. And like I said, this is not alpha and omega. Please, guys, this outline just to give you some of the research proposal, what you can include in your research proposal. Other colleges, they have specific items which needs to be included in their research proposal. All right. So you have to 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 compile to. Uh, uh, to, to, to that aspect of a, a request. If they say, we don't want any problem statement, so we are not going to include the problem statement in your research proposal. But if they say, we need a background of your study as, as a part of your research proposal, we need methodology, we need a problem statement, we need us to tell us about ethics, we need to tell us about literature, then also others other will ask you to say, we want to see a detailed plan, we are plan. Then we also have to put that to say, my plan is that maybe in the first week of, of April, I'll start to do a PC. In the second week, I'll do this and that and that. In the fourth month of May, I'll be doing this and that. If they want that plan, we have also to include in your research proposal. If also they want you to say, tell us about the budget. What do you think? What, what, what's your budget? How much are you going to spend in all of these processes? Then also to tell us about the budget, but you have to break it down. So it also depends on your college. But let's quickly look at some of the aspects which are needed there. I think the first one, like I've said under NP, I've said the different colleges may have their own outline. I think I've verified that more than once. But what's important is that they have put this component, all right, by using alphabets from A up to maybe K or Z and so on. But it doesn't mean when you write your research proposal, you have to put those alphabets. No, I'm just putting it so that uh, uh, to group them to say, well, this is number one. Doesn't mean that uh, if I've said number three is supposed to be uh, ethics, then your document also will have number three as ethics. Maybe it will come towards the end of your document. Document. I'm just using this um, numbering where I use alphabets so that we'll be able to see the, the, the aspects as, um, as isolated as much as possible, all right? Even though they fall within each other and so on. The first one is it, about the title. Some of you refer to it, to it as a topic. They may say that your title should not be more than uh, 20 words. 20 words, all right? All right, not letters, but 20 words. I think we understand the difference between letters and weights. For example, if I have, uh, I have the weight V, T H E, then it has three letters, but it's only one weight, all right? So they may say it should be not more than uh, 20 weights. Others they'll say it should not be more than 10 weights. So you have to stick to that, all right? <clears throat> but what's important about your title, I always say it emanates from a topic. We have this topic. Sometimes you use the word topic and title uh, 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 interchangeably, all right? But they mean almost the same thing. It's your topic. What's your topic? All right? How did you come with this topic? Why is this topic so important? Why is it so relevant? And remember, guys, when you, you develop your topic, you must be careful not to use other researchers' topics the way, the way they are. Maybe sometimes you're so interested in, in the work I've done the past years and so on, where I talk about staff development at primary schools, and you're interested in that. Don't phrase it the way it's been phrased in my own topic, because you know all of you guys, if that topic is subjected to turn it in, it's going to show the highest plagiarism. So you can use phrases around someone's topic. Maybe, for example, you want to talk about staff development. 
He takes someone's topic, which talks about staff development. Then in, in some of the ways you're going to put there, you're going to talk about staff development. But you change the way you write the topic. So that it suits you. All right. The other thing, when do you decide to have this topic? Why is this topic so important? If I can give you an example now, uh, I'm going to talk a lot, colleagues, but I'm going, I'm going to give you time also to talk. If I can give an example now, there's much and too much which has been written in, in, in regard to disciplinary measures at school. Right? You know, there's a lot about disciplinary measures at school. And it's still even prominent, even now. A student in a college of education can also research on disciplinary measures. All right, because it's something which is still there. All right. And and, and there are a lot of people who have written about that. And you end up having a lot of literature uh, talking about that also. So you can still talk about that aspect. In other words, there is no uh, uh, research topic which becomes outdated. I don't think so. All right, because it also depends on how you phrase your research, your, your research topic. Maybe you're looking at disciplinary measures. All right, maybe, for example, you are saying, what are the prominent disciplinary measures which have been used? at school A, B, and, and school C, all right? In other words, yours, you are focusing more on the prominent discipline method or measures which are used. But the out, outlining phrase, it is disciplinary measures, all right? But you are focusing it on a special uh, aspect. But what, what I always say, your topic always is broad, whereas the title is more specific. All right. Remember that if I talk about the, the document from the College of Education, we talk about niche focus areas. Those niche focus areas are broad. You can talk about, for example, intrusivity in schools. It's quite broad. So that is a more of a, a to, uh, uh, of a, of a type uh, of a topic. But your title, if you submit your work wanted to do uh, something related to inclusivity at, at schools. What you need to do, you need to narrow it down to be more specific. To so say maybe this topic or title I'm coming with is regard inclusivity in primary school, uh, maybe around Houghton uh, province. Then you become more specific. All right, so you need to make sure that it is more specific. Why are we saying that the title should be specific? So that it should not be all over the place. Because if it's not specific, you can even tell, tell us about maybe discipline, uh, inclusivity uh, in regard to school, and your title covers aspects which are done internationally in other countries. So it becomes broad. So you need to bring it home. So my focus is on this. And the other way to which I always use, I say the title should not, um, not it should not be ambiguous. In others, it should be clear. All right, it should just be clear. It should not confuse me or you as a researcher. It must be clear. Like I've said, you are not writing these things for you. You are writing it, it for a broader uh, community. For example, I'm sitting with I was sitting with another student's research proposal, uh, and 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 the student basically is not even based here in. So, but based on the title and the content, I was able to understand their educational setup, right? So that's why we say it should not be ambiguous. It must be clear, right? And the other thing about, I was saying that you need to avoid, you need to avoid starting a title with a present participle. Like I've seen some of those titles. What is a present participle? Basically, when you talk about a present past, uh, participle, it means it's a word formed from a verb. You know that a verb is a doing word, is it? All right. That can be used as an adjective or used to form a verb tense. An example. Uh, most of the um, uh, present part, uh, participles, they end up with the weight ing at the end. For example, analyzing, right? Investigation or investigating, right? It ends up with ing. Then so I'm saying most of the time a title should not end up with ing. Instead, you could say if 
instead of saying in, uh, investigating, you could say investigation, right? Or in, instead of saying uh, analy analyzing, you can say an analysis to avoid the present participle. But I've seen some of the colleagues are uh, putting their title using also the present participle and some of the supervisors, they don't have a problem with that. But um, I think the other most important part of the research proposal, it is your introduction, guys. Please, your introduction, your introduction, it should be catchy, all right? In other words, when I read your introduction, the first two or three sentences, they must be able to hook me into your research. They must be in inviting. They must be catching to say, wow, they're talking about this. So I want to hear more in the document. But if the, your introduction is not catchy and inviting, so I'll ask myself, what are we talking about here? And that's why I always, if I do read other students' work, I'll go and look at the topic. So, all right, the topic, topic is about this. But your first two or three sentence, sentences in your introduction, they talk about something different. So what's happening here? So you need to be more specific around that. That's why there are some point of food there. Sometimes we, we combine introduction and background. And other supervisors, they'll say, separate the two. Have the introduction and have the background uh, um, uh, as, an, as a standing item. All right. Sometimes you, you, you combine them, then you have introduction and background. But what, how, how to start your, in, in, um, your introduction? I said, start with an interesting opening sentences to draw a reader's attention. That's your introduction. All right. If I talk about discipline and pressure at the school, let's say, for example, I'm focusing around how thing. I'll say, discipline is still a, 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 a most prominent problem in schools around housing. Even though there are various discipline measures which uh, uh, teachers can, can apply to discipline the learners, as per this document, or right, if there's a document around that or circular, still teachers are inflicting corporal punishment to our learners. I I'm trying to think loud about this introduction. It's not supposed to be like that. But someone will say, this person tells us to say, there is a law, there is a policy which says learners are not supposed to, discipline, to be disciplined or given corporate punishment, but teachers are doing it. What's the problem here? Then already, if I have that type of introductory sentence, it's also going to come up when I'm looking at the problem statement. Say, so actually, what's the problem? There's an act which says this. There's a, 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 the question also says this, right? There's a circular from, from schools which talks about this, but people are doing it, right? So it's also going to assist when you, you formulate your problem statement where you show the gap. All right, the other thing which you need to do, you need to give a description of the basic facts. There must be facts. And you can base your facts on literature, by the way. But remember that in your introduction, you are not supposed to give more and more of the literature. No, because you still have a section on literature review. So you can touch on few literatures, based, which is going to pick up the introduction you are having there. And also you can provide some, more, some important research areas. You can tell us what has been done, maybe internationally in regards to the topic, or maybe within the continent. Then you narrow it down to your context. Well, you can also include your research area. And someone may ask me, how much am I supposed to write uh, in this introduction? It also depends on the requirements. Others, they will tell you that your introduction should not, should not be more than maybe 200 words. All right? And sometimes others won't tell you. But at the end of the day, your research proposal, there are weights which you need to cover or the pages. So now you have to look at those aspects as a, as a researcher to say, am I supposed to give a lot about introduction and background and less on research methodology or less on literature review? So we say, maybe you can say to your student, what's important to me here, maybe it's the methodology. Then 
with the bulk of my research proposal, I'm going to talk more on my research methodology and less on my literature. But if you feel that your research proposal, the bulk of the work should be uh, to be put under literature review, it means it's where you elaborate a lot. So you have to weigh those aspects. And I like it when I talk about that, especially when I advise the students on how to write an article. I also break it down in almost similar like that. All right. But we talk about that maybe during our, our future presentations. And also we need to give a background. What's the background? I think the background for me, you need to bring you, uh, your reader into your world. Remember, your reader must understand you. All right? You are the researcher. You are the one who's doing this topic on inclusivity in schools around Hauke. No one else. So you must bring them into your world. What's happening in your own space? All right? If, for example, you are going to touch on 30 primary schools, what's happening on those schools? Actually, in regards to that aspect. But you're not going to say in school A, inclusivity, education, it's about this. No, no, no. But they must understand the context. They must understand your world. Where are you based? Right? I can give a simple example now when I want to put, uh, try to bring each something to my own world. If, for example, I'm writing about something which has to do with um, uh, uh, study skills, I'm making an example. If my topic is about understanding and application of study skills at the at university A, B, or C, what I need to tell them in my background, what's happening around the study skills in that university? All right? I need to tell them so they must understand it. Then from there, I can expand. Then I can go when I do my literature. I need to tell also my, my reader about what's happening internationally in regards to uh, aspects uh, of study skills, what's happening in the, in the continent by citing one or two countries. So a reader will have a, a more of a global view, not knowing not only about you in your context, but understanding the other context within, uh, uh, within the outside border of the, of the country. We also need to give the motivation of the research, tell us where we are coming from and why this research is important. So it's within the background. And sometimes all of this, especially these two, they always come towards the end when you write your background. It could become, become the last paragraph or the last sentences, all right? Like I've said, you're not supposed to give too much literature on this part, the introduction and the background, because you still have that uh, separate section on, on those aspects where you talk about uh, literature review or literature study in detail in your research proposal. The other aspect which we need to put in your research proposal, and sometimes, or well, maybe I need to talk about something regarding the, I think of, of a few notes. All right, on how to write the, Two aspects which you need to consider when you write the background. One, you need to start by providing a clear description of your standing, where you are coming from. I think I've spoken about that one. And also, uh, when sharing about the problem, history, be specific, all right? Because remember that the study is more specific. It's about specific aspects. So even when you talk about the, 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 the problem, history, it must be more specific should not be, should not generalize. And also last, lastly, you need to back your argument with sources, which you get them from uh, literatures, you get them from seculars, you get from eggs or policies. Please, as much as we like to use other sources to get information, let's avoid some of these sources, especially sources which have not been peer reviewed, right? Always avoid sources which have not been peer reviewed. Basically, what I'm trying to say, avoid sources which can be changed at any time and they have one person voice. What do I mean by that? If, for example, I'm not saying guys you should not use TikTok. It's fine. Maybe if it works for you, all right. YouTube, if, if it works for you, it's fine. But most of the time, some of those uh, aspects or those, th those type of sources, they are not being peer reviewed. No one has looked at them. It's only the, 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 the people who have developed them only. They didn't get another views from other people. But if you use uh, articles, if you use books, 
if you use encyclopedias, dictionaries, and all of those, circulars, and all of this, those are the peer reviewed documents, all right? And other colleagues, they'll argue with me that even Wikipedia, I'm telling you guys, you must be, be try to, to be careful about Wikipedia. Anyone, if I have something under Wikipedia, and I put it myself as welcome, anyone can change it. Anyone can change it. And anyone can lie about welcome by developing a, a, a Wikipedia. They can give me the qualification I don't have with the intention that they must ruin my, ruin my life. When it's picked up there in Wikipedia, people will make noise around it. So uh, most of the time I didn't use that platform because for me, it's not peer reviewed, honestly. All right, but articles, use them, books, use them. And I don't know what search uh, organ do you, you are going to use, but in my case, I always, we use different searching uh, uh, platforms or organs, all right? But I use Google Scholar most of the time, and it gives me the best results. So you need also to identify the one you're going to use, right? I think the other aspect which you need to talk about in regards to the component, we need to talk about the problem statement. Whereas other colleges, they refer to it as a people statement. I don't know the difference, but for me, it's almost the same. What you're supposed to do in your problem statement, just go to go there. And this section should basically, I always say, is, it is the heart of your research proposal. That's your heart. Your problem statement, why I'm saying that, it's where you also show the gap, right? Could be the gap in regards to the, to the concept you are, you are trying to research on, or it could be the gap in regards to the literature. So the gap is always been shown on the problem statement. And I know that sometimes it's the most difficult aspect which our students are, are struggling to develop. All right, they all struggle with problem statement. Other people will give you a problem statement of, out of five pages. Whether it could be a PhD, I argue. Whether it's a PhD, I don't think the problem statement should be more than a page. Well, others they'll justify it, but by the time you, you take your problem statement in your research reporting, then your five pages, I'll end up seeing a lot of literature, which you have a, a section for it. And at the end, I will ask a student, what is the problem? What is your problem statement? After I've read all of those five pages, I don't see a problem statement yet. And people will become offended. That's why I say at the master's level, what you would say, for me, one or two paragraph, paragraphs, it's enough. Then I'll be able to see the gap. Because at the end, remember that I want to talk about, when I talk about the problem statement, I, I can come with the aspect of a sandwich. You know, a sandwich where uh, outside it's your bread, then inside the sandwich you have your bologna, you have your cheese, you have your other, you have baked beans, and so on. So your problem statement statement must be like that. Then at the bottom of your your sandwich again you have bread, because if you don't have a bread on top and bottom, it means all the ingredients you have put them in the metal there they can fall, all right, and can end up with uh, only bread. So yeah. Problems they think about when develop it, think about the sandwich, right? I don't know if it does make sense. What do I mean about that? In other words, the outline of your problem statement is where you are going to tell us what does the literature say. To what does um, um, where do you have any circular or policy or end who talks about this problem, all right? Then from there, in the middle, then you tell us about the gap. What is the gap? Basically, in the middle, what is happening. So for that, then at the bottom, you tell us about the gap. I'll give you this example. I know it's difficult. Let's say, for example, I'm doing a study on, uh, I'll, I'll go back to corporal punishment as an example for now. Then maybe my study is based on, uh, contribution of com, uh, uh, corporal punishment to, to learner drop out, all right? I'm, I'm looking at on how um, this corporal punishment results to some of the learners 
to drop out from school. The mother will say, on top of my sandwich, I'll tell them to say, in South Africa, the South African uh, constitution have abolished corporal punishment, where it says no learner should be punished at school. And also the South African School Act supports that. Act so and so, all right? But in the middle where I talk about the, 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 the ingredients there, what is happening? What is happening is that some of the school or school A and B, they are still inflicting corporal punishment to our learners as a means of discipline. That's what's happening. Then from the ones the gap, the last part of, of my sandwich at the bottom, this indicates that there is no fit between what is expected from the policy and what's happening in the real life. Because still, even in this century, teachers are still incorporating corporal punishment to our learners, even though it has been punished a long time ago. So it tells you the gap. Say, so look, these people are aware about the, this act or this secure regarding this aspect, but they are doing it. So the gap is that there is no fit between reality. In other words, what is expected from these teachers is not being done. They do the opposite, right? And that's why it can also lead to students or learners drop out. I'm just thinking about all these things, guys. I know that's difficult, especially if you don't write them down. But what I'm trying to say is that simple. If you can just, when you develop your problem statement, you think about the sandwich. One, the outside, the fat slice of your sandwich, or maybe you are, um, I don't know if you, you, you use um, bread or you use rolls, but the first part on top there, it tells you about what is expected. I couldn't use certain points or add particular. Then the middle part of it, what is happening? That's the ingredients you have there. You utter your balloon, you name them. Then at the bottom, what is the gap? You tell us about the gap. So if you can have that in between, you'll be able to develop a best um problem statement but basically guys that aspect which i'm talking about number c then the problem statement some of them colleges or supervisors would want it in a certain way others they'll guide you to say your problem statement must always answer the following aspects all right they must be able to answer those aspects some of the questions definitely which you must make sure which i'm repeating some of the things i've said in regards to the sandwich approach one what is the problem what is actually the problem so when i read your problem statement i must able to say to see the actual problem why is this a problem why do you think the problem is identified there it is a problem and remember that i've said the problem statement it is the heart of your research without that part or component in your research, you don't have a research. There must be something. There must be a problem. There must be something which bothers you. Another question is that which need which the problem statement needs to answer. It needs to tell us about what are the causes, all right, or effect of this problem. What causes? Remember that I've spoken about what's happening there in the sandwich, the ingredients. Why are these people doing it? Why? And I'm telling you, when you look at the problem set statement, some of the questions which you're going to ask, whether it could be qualitative or quantitative, they are going to try to answer some of these questions in your problem statement, all right? And basically this problem, who are affected by it? Who are, who are affected by this problem? If the problem is that, we have the policy, we have the guidelines, we have the seculars, we have the constitution, we have the, an act, the South African School Act, which says no more corporal punishment. And if you as a school, you are still inflicting it, what are the people who are going to be affected by, by, by this? And remember that. You may find that at the end, this problem does not only affect these learners in the school, it affects everyone within the country. Because remember that these learners, at the end, they are coming from the society. And the end, they're going to end up in the society. 
So if, if they drop out from schools because of corporal punishment, we are creating the youth who, who cannot take their own responsibility. And we end up with all those societal ills which you see. All right? I think, colleagues, when you write your proposal, research proposal, your problem statement next time, you won't struggle. I think I'll spend more, more time on that. And the reason being that I've seen students are struggling with that aspect of the time. Then they may ask you, maybe, for example, instead of having, um, after your problem statement, they may ask you to have a purpose statement, which is almost the same like the problem statement for me. I don't know. But basically, they say it must be also specific and precise and also concise. It must be clear and not be ambiguous and not confusing. And also, it needs to be goal oriented. Start in terms of desired outcomes. In other words, your purpose statement, there must be a goal which you want to attain within your research or within your uh, people's statement. But the other aspect of uh, um, people's statement, which you also need to look at, the um, major components which, which are, uh, need to be there in your people's statement. I think some of those, could, uh, the first one is the motivation or the driving force of your dissertation or your, your research, what motivates you, all right? to do this research or study. And also the importance, the significance of this research, you need to also to include, to engage those aspects. Why is it so important, right? The other thing maybe they can ask you to include, they can include the research question. In other words, in your, pro, in your paper statement, you can also include your research question. We're going to talk about the research questions later, all right? And I think I've given an example there of a paper statement. It says the purpose of this report is to describe the main causes of traffic congestion um, in Santin. Or the other one could be this paper will describe four common causes of core worker conflict in organization and so on. Those are some of the examples. All right. I want us also to look at another uh, uh, component, the, uh, the aim of the research. Sometimes you have also to include what's the aim of your research. And basically, all of, all of us know that the aim are broad. So if you have this broad aim, you need to narrow it down to objectives to say, how are you going to achieve this aim? That's your objectives. You have an aim which is broad. Then you tell us in your objectives, how are you going to achieve this aim? I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, my aim is to ensure that by the end of this year, uh, I write a, a, an article. That's an aim, it's quite broad. So in order to break it down, I break it down by formulating objectives. I, I say, for me to reach that aim, I'll make sure that I attend some of the developmental workshops regarding uh, um, article writing. I'll conduct literature review. I'll do this and that. In our way, you come with the objectives, all right? And uh, let's go to look at objectives. Objectives are narrow and precise, tangible. You can measure them. It's very important. You can't measure your aim. Because it's broad, right? But if I take my aim, then I break it down to objectives. Then I can measure it to say, all right, your aim is APC. Have you achieved it? Then you say, yes, I've achieved all the aims or, or the aim itself. All right, I've achieved this aim. Then I say, how did you achieve it? Tell me. Then you go to, to your objectives to say, I've done one, two, three. All right, so your, your objectives are more specific and they are measurable. You can measure them. That's why we say always your objectives, they must adhere to the principle of SMART. They must be simple, they must be measurable, they must be achievable, they must be realistic, and also they have a time frame. All right. But the other component which you also need to include, especially. Those who are doing my honors, it's fine. You're going to write your, 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 your assignment, your research assignment. They may not ask you to talk about the theoretical framework. They may not, all right? It depends also on the college. But those who are doing your master's, 
you can't have a master's uh, research proposal, then you don't tell us about the theory which you are going to follow, the theoretical framework. I know that those who are, who, who are more doing human resource management, there are a lot of theories can use around that, right? For example, there are a lot of leadership theories, right? There are a lot of theories which talks about uh, uh, managing change, like transactional theories and so on. They are more related to human resource. But remember that even those, the, for example, the theory, which is, is, is um, more related to human resource department, I can also, also use it in the College of Education. I can give you a simple example. In my case, when I was doing my, my, my PhD some time ago, I, my PhD had two literature review chapters, two, not one. In masters, most of the time you have one chapter for your literature review, but in PhD, you can have more than one. In my case, I have more, the first chapter was looking at uh, disciplinary measures, uh, discipline in general. Then the other chapter was, was looking at managing of change. Because remember that I was focusing more on staff development and also how to manage the change which are coming to the staff itself. So I have, and I needed to have a, a separate literary view around that. So at the end, when I put my theoretical framework, I have to borrow one of the theory from the human resource uh, people, all right? Where they talk about transactional leadership. So I have to borrow their theory and it, should, it fits so well in my dissertation, all right? Because already I had a chapter around that. So what I'm trying to say in your, research, you may have more than one theory, all right? And I know that those who are do, doing HR, and not HR, um, psychology, most of, most of my, stu my students, they are still talking about the theory of uh, Pandura, if I'm not mistaken, all right? But there are a lot of theories, not only Pandura, there are a lot of them, all right? You can factor the other theories as long they talk to your study. All right. Most of the time in masters, we expect students to share with us maybe one theory, but other students, what they do, they share with us maybe more than one. Other students, for example, they can share us in the College of Education, the theory of um, behaviorism or the theory of social uh, uh, connectivism and so on. So there are a lot of theories around that. All right. But in, a, in, your, in your PhD, study those who are there already are doing their phd definitely i want to see in your in your in your research report or your research proposal as i want to see more than one theory it's a fact you can't have one theory it should be more than one but if you cannot have more than one uh, um, um, theory in phd it's fine you elaborate more and that's why i always say to my students those who are in phd most of the time they have a, a, a chapter which stands there who talks about theoretical framework. Most of the time, it's your first chapter, all right, chapter one. Uh, chapter two, definitely most, most of the time, it's your literature. Then sometimes if you have one uh, literature discipline, you, talk, you have only one chapter on, on literature review. Then the next chapter, you talk about the theoretical framework. You talk about the theory, all right? Then from there, you talk about research methodology and so on. The same thing with your masters. Your masters, definitely, you don't need to have a chapter on theoretical framework. No, you can infuse it. And other students, they infuse it with literature. Others, they infuse it with uh, research methodology. But there should be a section which talks about theoretical framework. So what is a theoretical framework? It always gives a strong scientific research base. In other words, you are basing your argument on a certain theory, right? If, for example, I'm talking about on how our students learn or study, all right? Then I uh, maybe somewhere I talk about scaffolding to, the, to say with the studies or um, uh, the way uh, lectures have been presented or classes, we use scaffolding, all right? What is scaffolding? Basically today, I'm introducing you to scaffolding. I want you to understand these components, which are almost main of the research proposal. But I'm not going to touch on in all of these components in detail. I'll give you a brief outline of each. Then starting from next week, I'll talk about research methodology. 
The other week, maybe I'll talk about quantitative research. The other week, I'll talk about quantitative data collection and so on. It means now I'm scaffolding my presentation or workshops, all right? I do them gradually, the scaffolding. So if I'm a student and uh, I want to bring a theory maybe in the College of Education, where I talk about how students learn, then I talk about scaffolding. Then I can use maybe a theory which talks about scaffolding, which is presented by Yogoski, all right? I can talk about the theory of Yogoski, where he talks about scaffolding. All right, guys, uh, you, you can bear with me. Most of my example definitely will, will be around uh, the College of Education and in beach bit of HR and so on. That's where I'm coming from. But I, I'm trying to just to explain some of the concept here. And always it says, the second period, it says the theoretical framework always comes after your problem statement, all right? And aims of, of the start. In other words, you cannot have chapter one, then the first part becomes introduction, then the next part becomes theoretical framework. No, you need to tell us about other aspects before. I need to see the aims, all right? Or maybe I need to see the problem statement. Then I'll see maybe the aims and objectives. Then I'll see the theoretical framework after that. Then I'll go to the research methodology. Then I'll end up there maybe with ethics and all of those aspects. So they need to follow a little bit of that sequence. It shows that the research physical framework, it shows that the research is grounded and based on scientific theory. You need to tell us and we need to know that you have study. We don't thumb suck it. It is based on a certain theory. You give a certain theory in order to support your research. So my research, it's underpinned by this theoretical framework. And I'm telling you guys, when you talk about theoretical framework, you must also check whether it talks to your research. I can't talk about, for example, if maybe I'm looking at something which related to uh, how can I put it? Well, let's say, for example, I'm still talking about um, uh, aspect related to learning, how students learn, all right, in schools. Then from there, I come with a theoretical framework. Then I, I'm going to talk about um, a, 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 a theory of maybe of Ubud in my work. Then I come with a theory of Ubuntu. How does a theory of Ubuntu relate to how students learn? It's very questionable. The why always when you read this aspect, you check whether this theory, it talks to your study. It must talk to your study to say, all right, this is a theory which underpin my study. And why this theory underpin my research? You justify all of those things, all right? It also shows that the research is grounded and based on scientific theorem. And it also describes that you need to describe the theory that underpins your study or research. How do you write this theoretical framework? Let's say we're in the master's uh, class. Then I'll say theoretical framework. Then I'll say maybe the study which underpin my theory is a uh, cognitive uh, uh, theory by so and so. All right? Then from there, I describe this cognitive theory. What does it mean? What is it? All right? What are the good things about it, for example? For example? Then from there, at the bottom, I will say maybe a paragraph or two, how this theory relates to my research and why I've chosen this theory specifically. That's why I have the last point. You also need, need to indicate on how this theory is linked to your uh, study topic. And all of this, sometimes it's difficult to write all this stuff up. But I always encourage my students. If you are struggling with a certain section of your, your research proposal, you need to read about it. Just read about it and see on how various authors they frame that part of a component. If, for example, I'm struggling with methodological framework and I'm within the College of Education and the Department of Inclusivity and so on, there are a lot of written theses around that. I can source them online. I don't need to go to, the, to, to any campus. You source them online via the library. Then you're able to look at some. How other colleagues have formulated their... Uh, 
uh, different types of their and especially their M and their D. Always, if you want to get it right, right, not to struggle with your writing most of the time, try to visit the latest thesis or dissertation which your super uh, your supervisor has written with the student. All right, should not be more five days. Then you are able to play some of these things, and you are able to, to to put it in your, your own context. The other important concept which you need to talk about, the you know, other connection you need to have, so whether it's I'm sure about you, uh, humanities. All right, I'm also sure about education. I'm not sure about theology, but what I'm trying to say, we are research proposal, it must tell us, tell us about the research questions which you want to answer. There must be research questions. There must be something which you want to answer there. It could be hypothesis, right? But others who or project is coming with research questions, one hypothesis. Others will say you want both of them, right? Others, you are the one who is supposed to decide as a student whether you are presenting hypothesis or research questions, right? The other aspect you need to talk about it's a research questions or hypothesis. I'm going to share the two, all right? So that if they ask you to develop the hypothesis, maybe you also need to know about that. If they ask you to develop the research questions, you need to be able to develop the research questions. All right, basically in regards to the research questions, it's going to be a section in your, in your research proposal where maybe it could be research questions, then from there, what you need to do, you tell us about the main question. What is the main question which you want to answer in your research, the main one? Then from there, you tell us about the sub-questions which are emanating or coming from the main question. All right? You may have three or four or five sub-questions. And I don't expect you guys to have 10 sub-questions. I don't think... Uh, Maybe it depends on the level of your study. Maybe your PhD can have 10 sub questions, but I know that even at PhD level, five questions are sufficient. In at most three questions are sufficient, or five, all right? So you don't have to quantify, but basically, you can have so many sub questions. All right? So, how do you develop the main question? Or before you come there, let's see, let's look at the different different types of the research questions. The first one, which I'm projecting there, it talks about descriptive. The other one is a comparative. The other one, it is relationship-based. I think all these concepts, they explain themselves. Descriptive, comparative, or the easership somewhere there. The first one, which you call the descriptive. Example of that, I could have research questions. What disciplinary measures that are used by teachers at selected high school? What are those? But the other one, which talk about comparative research questions, it could read as follows. Basically, I'm talking about the main question here. What are the difference could be? Not the difference which are used to different school. Then my research question, it becomes more comparative. The other one, what I'm doing here, to help, right? Talk about, uh, their, uh, about their behavior. How do they behave in regards to these prior measures? I look at female, I look at male, and so on. All right? But basically, when you look at your... Uh, I think the important aspect in regards to the main question, how do you develop the main question? When you look at this example, this one, right? It talks about descriptive research question. I've taken it from the main question, right? In other words, for you to have the main type topic, right? And convert it into a question. Your title will all topic and you convert it into a question. Then you end up having the main question. I think it works better in that way. Let's quickly look at the hypothesis. 
basically, right? Or an explanation. It's a theory. That is provincially accepted. Underline the word provincially accepted. It's just a hypothesis. It's, it's, it's a supposition. We, we suppose if this happened, this will be an outcome. It's just a hypothesis. In order to in interpret certain events or phenomena and to provide guidance to further investigation. Why do I say hypothesis is a supposition? For example, we have a supposition to say if you drink coffee in the evening around about seven, you are going to struggle to fall asleep. It's a supposition. It's a hypothesis. And that hypothesis, because it's a, a supposition, it needs to be tested. And how do you test it? You test it via research. We can have control. All right. What do I mean control? I mean, for example, I can have two young um, children, maybe at the age of 10, the same age. The one I give them coffee at seven o'clock, then the other one I don't give them coffee at seven o'clock. Then I check which one of those young kids is going to struggle with falling asleep. In other words, I want to check the hypothesis. I test it by means of control. I think most of you are familiar with that. I remember when I was still at primary school, long time ago, uh, when we were doing uh, science, sometimes they, they would ask us to take a, a, a chart and put different leaves and cover those leaves with a plastic and put them indoor inside the classroom for a week. Then I have another a group of plants, which you, you put them with a glue, all right, you stick them with a glue, then you put them outside the classroom for a week. Then after a week, you do an observation what happens. And most of the time, the one which was covered in plastic, and you put them in, inside the classroom, the leaves, they become more dry and so on. But the others which you have put them outside, yes, they become drier, but not the same that the one which you have put them inside the classroom. The reason being that the one which you have put them outside, they have a, a little bit of sunlight. All right. They are able to, to get some of the sunlight, but the other one didn't get sunlight. Then set up of the hypothesis through a control method. I think of some of you are doing life sciences, you are familiar with that. But basically there are two there are many types of, of hypothesis. All right. You have um, simple hypothesis empirical, but we are going to focus on these two one, which are mostly the null hypothesis. I think of that. I already spoke of the example I've just given. But basically, what does a high, uh, null hypothesis uh, we build H O, right? Whereas the if and then we represent it with the symbol H one, right? So let's get. get is contrary to the positive statements of a working hypothesis. According to it, there is no relationship. Please underline that one. In the null hypothesis, basically, there is no relationship between variable A and T for if and then hypothesis. There is a relationship. Oh, excuse me, there's something wrong here. I don't explain. There is a relationship. Let's give you this, get this example with develop a null hypothesis. I could say hyperactivity is unrelated to eating soup. It's a null hypothesis. In other words, there is no relationship between a person to be more hyperactive and taking a little bit of sugar. There is no relationship, right? But if I go, uh, uh, I go to another one, the second one, the red one says, is no significant relationship between school discipline and student academic performance. But when I develop the if and then or alternative hypothesis, I can put it in this way. They is, but in the if and then, there is a relationship. 
is seeking to pursue and development, right? And this needs to be proven. And also this one should be proven. If I say your academic performance so being affected, then the literature review also is very important, colleagues. And we always encourage our students to do literature review if possible. But at masters, like I've said, most of the students are doing literature study. But at PhD, I don't have mercy around that. When they submit, I want a thorough literature review. But basically, in your literature review, we always say uh, study your literature should not be old. In other words, make sure that your literature is not more than 10 years old from now, from 2023. And always I encourage my students to be not more than five years old. The reason why we say your literature should not be more than, should not be old, because sometimes when you do your, 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 your document, your dissertation or your thesis, you intend to publish. And by the time you write your article, you find that the, the literature you've given there is outdated and it's too old, all right? But sometimes we also have old literature. For example, if in the, in the section of research methodology, most of the aspects, students, they use old literature, but I know that there's a current literature in regards to uh, research method, methods and so on. But the theoretical framework, we find that you are using a theory of 1968, it's also fine, all right? But what I'm trying to say, it should not be old, especially the literature, literature review or the literature we are using. Then we have a section which we call the research design. I think that's a section which we will we'll be looking at next week, where we talk about the research design, how to break down the research design. The research design is made out of different components. It, it is made out of the research methodology. There's a difference between research design and research methodology. It's not the same thing. So one aspect is form part of your research design. It is your research methodology. We have the data collection, we have your, your, your sample, your population, your data an analysis, and all of those things, they more fall on your research um, uh, design uh, and they follow the research methodology. But basically, your research design is an outline on how an investigation will take place. And the other thing which you need to include about the research de design, I always say it's a framework or a plan. Someone spoke about the framework. Framework when we're talking about uh, the expectation or what the research proposal is all about, all right? So your research design is also a framework, all right? And we are going to talk about all of these aspects data collection, data analysis. We are going to talk about the paradigm, right? the angle. Then we are going to talk about some of these paradigms, like for example, a, a, epistemology and so on. What is that? We are going to share about some of those aspects. Then another important aspect of your research uh, design, like I've said, it talks about the methodology. What methods have you used in your study? Then it's a research methodology. And why have you used this research methodology? And how have you used it, all right? And also, what research instrument you will be using if you are using this type of research methodology? If, for example, I say the research methodology I'll be using is quantitative, I, therefore, the instrument which I'll be using to collect data is to be more aligned to quantitative. In other words, I'll use a, a survey or a questionnaire. I can use interviews, all right, or interview schedule if my methodology is quantitative, all right? If I say my methodology, which I'm going to use here is qualitative, definitely the data collection instrument I'll be used to collect data with is going to be an interview schedule, all right? But at the same time, remember, if I say the methodology here, yeah, it's a mixed method methodology. In other words, it's about quality. The document, I must share the two types of data collection instrument, all right, which I'm going to use. You also need to take a sample, all right? Um, and also, when you talk about the sample, you need also to tell us how what technique have you used to derive the sample. You can just, cannot just say, for example, out of five 
it's fine. SPSS, right? If it's qualitative, are you going to use the atlas to I eight as an analysis or give it to him? Population. I go to give it to a, a few people. Let's say, for example, five people from a certain school before you roll out the questionnaire. To but basically, I want, those are the aspects we are supposed to put in regards to uh, the ethics. It's one of the important aspects, guys. Before you can conduct any or collect any data, you need to get the ethical clearance for the institution, which you apply it. So the ethics they give you, guys, you can use the ethics. I'm, I'm not sure about the institution itself, because other institutions, when they give you ethical clearance, they, 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 they don't limit you and give you a limited time. Say so you need to use it for only this year. It becomes an open, then you use it even forever. But other institutions will say, no, no, we give an ethic clearance for a current year only. So you can't use it in the following year. So you need to apply again for another ethics. But you can't collect the data if you have not get ethical clearance from the institution. Please, you get that one. Then from there, if, for example, you're going to collect data, maybe in, in economic sciences, maybe in, in mining and so on, you also need to get permission from those institutions. If it's uh, Department of Education, you also need to apply for, for permission to the various uh, um, uh, Department of Education according, according to the provinces. All right. And the, the other aspect you need to input also, you need to tell us about why this research is important, the significance. And also, please, guys, remember that in your research proposal, at the end, we need you to indicate the re reference list because you have used other people's sources, all right, or information. So you must provide the reference list. And that, that it also talks to the reference staff. If they say use APA, then you use APA. If they say use Harvard, then you use Harvard, all right? Then what's important, again, you need also to indicate the keywords. And also, what I like about that, also need to develop, if I ask you about the work breakdown timeline, have your own, all right? Where you put activities into place, all right? So that, for example, in this one, my phase one, as an example, then it says uh, development of a proposal. That's my phase one. Then I'll put items. Let's say maybe item one to item three, I'll, it talks about this phase. If I can one to three talks about this phase, then I'll say in item one, what am I going to do? I put the activity, maybe attend a workshop like this one, then I'll start maybe on the same day, maybe the 17th, up to the 17th of March, same day. The resources which you'll need, you'll need maybe a laptop, you'll need add time or data, and also the person responsible, the stakeholders, and also the report or feedback. Normally, here I always write complete, not yet complete. If I completed the task, I just write complete. This time timeline, it also assists you a lot. So if you put it to say, starting from the 1st of April, I'm going to focus on the first phase, all right, for the whole month. The following month of May, you are able to look back if maybe you are lacking in some of the activities. It makes you also to be updated, to be updated with your research studies, right? That's why I'll say to my students most of the time, if you can spend a week or even a month without looking at your research work, it means you are losing a lot as a student. But a time frame also, it encourages you, it gives you a little bit of focus. All right, these are some of the logic of research proposal. I'll talk about them also next week. Don't worry about this one. What is a good research? If you talk about the good research, you need to see some of the following. Uh, it should not be duplication of a previous work. All right, we can expand. Remember that if you're doing your honors and you want to proceed with your master's in the same field, you can expand your own uh, research, all right, based on your title, all right? But you're not supposed to write the same title the way it is. You expand it. They say, for example, in your honors, you have this title and you've used one research method. They say qualitative. 
then we want to expand it to your masters. You can have, have almost similar uh, title where you rephrase it, but you, you can also say in your methodology, you are going to use uh, mixed methods. So we add another method, all right? So there are a lot of things which are going to come there being new. The other thing is that all research ethical standards should be should have been met. You must meet the research ethical standard. You see when I talk about ethics in one of the presentation, how strongly and how uh, how how I, I normally present that part of ethics. Because remember, ethics is very important. If you don't do things ethically, they can catch up with you in the next fifty years when you have left. If, for example, you do a desk research and you lie and you tell us you went out and conduct interview, all, 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 all to find that you didn't conduct any, any interview. If they find out that thing in future, you are you could be in trouble. And sometimes you'll be in trouble and you'll be holding a certain position in the society when they refer you to your master's uh, studies. So we need to be more ethical around those things. The other important part is that it should be feasible as per uh, population sample and also a time frame. All right. You also need to, it should not be costly. Research should not be costly, honestly. All right. If you feel that doing research and quality data in 30 primary schools in your area is going to cost you a lot, why do you go and collect it from 30 primary schools? I can collect it from five schools and I, I can also write my PhD around that. It's not cost it should be cheap all right so you need a way on how to to avoid it to be more cost yeah yeah i think those are the few points i want to share i want us to reflect and if there are any aspect you want me to elaborate a little bit remember that if you are registered with your institution i'll just give you with this example if you are registered with UNISA, like you are, most of you, you apply for the research ethical clearance via the college or the department, and your supervisor is going to assist you around that. There are forms which you need to complete, all right? And the forms are very detailed. Like I was saying at the beginning, that definitely, maybe for now, before the closing date of the submission of your research proposal, maybe somewhere October, November, they, they'll ask you to submit at least maybe 480 weights. I'm just making an example for masters, all right? Maybe PhD would be 600 weights. That's not the food of proposal, but they are going to check your submission based on those, or on, on the, the, the mini research proposal you've submitted of 450 or 480 weights. Then from there, as then you go and develop a fully research proposal, which you present, and if it's been accepted, then the supervisor will indicate to you that you must apply for ethical clearance within the institution. So you can't apply for ethical clearance if your supervisor has not given a go ahead because you also read and you also give feedback on those research proposals, all right? Then from them, the institution is going to give you an ethical clearance according to your research. And remember that that ethical clearance which you have been given, you also have, you have also attached your research proposal. If you say in your research proposal, if you say in your research proposal, you are going to use quantitative methods and they have accepted your research proposal in that regard and they've granted you ethical clearance also. When you decide after you have your ethical clearance, maybe next year you say, no, I'm going to use uh, maybe qualitative methods. What that says, you need to go back and rework on your ethical clearance again, because what you've said there is no longer applicable now, all right? But basically you need it to get via, via the institution, your supervisor will assist you around that, all right? And it sometimes it, it, it depends, because remember, remember that the ethical clearance committee, they have timelines, they have dates on which they are sitting, all right? They don't, they don't meet every week, they have their own uh, dates. If, for example, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example about this. The co correctional services, most of the time they, 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 they give us the dates on which the research committee will sit nationally. Normally they give, I think, four or five dates. So if you miss any of those dates in a year, the current year, it means they are not going to look at your, your, your research proposal and give you ethics. So they are going to look at it next year. So 
sometimes it takes time. It takes time, right? It also depends on the community itself. Uh, someone is saying, do we need ethical clearance even at honors level? All right. One for honors level, it also depends on the college. All right. If I just give you this example, if I'm doing my honors and I'm saying to myself as a student, I'm going to collect data from the from students who are studying at UNISA. Or I'm going to collect data from uh, staff who are working at UNISA. Definitely you need to get ethical clearance because you are using the institution population. You need to get ethical clearance, all right? Then, but if in your honors for argument's sake, you say, I'm going to go to collect data, but the data I'm going to collect, I'm going to collect from school A in my vicinity, all right? Remember, because you are collecting data in another institution, you need ethical clearance from that institution. And most of the time, if you collect data from a school, you need to apply for ethical clearance if you are in Houghton, for argument's sake, you apply it from the Houghton Department of Education. I think that pays somewhere in Johannesburg. Then you complete those forms for ethical uh, permission. They give you permission to say you can collect data from the schools, either from learners or teachers, or from the SGP and so on. All right. But remember that it does not end up there. If you get that permission letter, you need to forward it from, for example, to the district, uh, uh, to your district. All right, where the district official will give you permission. And after forwarded to the district official, you need also to present it to the school governing body. They normally sit and they look at your, uh, your request. If they allow you to do that, they allow you. In other words, you can get the permission from the Houghton Department of Education, but the school governing body can say, we don't want you to collect data from our school. All right, even though you have a permission, so you need to follow also all those, those things, and sometimes it takes time, but it works because you do things ethically, all right? And remember that why we, we emphasize this, this issue of ethics, because the data you're going to collect and analyze and write a report about in a research uh, report, like I've said, is going to stay there for many years and many years to come. And someone maybe, Another year, maybe after 10 years, will say, I don't remember you doing your honors, but now you tell us you have a PhD. Can you see now? Then you're able to produce. You say, look, here is my research proposal. Here are my documents. Here, this was a permission which I was granted by the Department of Education, and also I've collected data, I've analyzed it. Here are the sample of my, my questionnaire from school A or B and so on. So here are the uh, sample of a transcript in regards to the interviews. You provide evidence. That's why everything which you keep, you must store it for at least 10 years. Don't destroy it. All right? If you go there and interview people, maybe, I don't know, in the past, in our case, we used to use the, 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 the tape recorders where we have cassettes. I still have some of those cassettes with me. I still have the questionnaire with me. I didn't throw it for my master's and also for my PhD. So if people argue in, maybe I don't know by, by when they should have argued now to say I didn't have a master's, but I'm just putting it for the sake of uh, having a record. There's a research I've done currently at the uh, Houghton Department of Education. I think it was 2015. I still have the questionnaire even now in my office. I don't destroy it because as I publish, as I write, I need to put that research uh, number they've given me in my articles, all right? I'm not sure if I've uh, elaborated a lot. So I wanted to ask, uh, from, from a timeline uh, perspective, uh, to have a good proposal and get ethical clearance so that you can actually start doing your research, uh, in your experience, how much time is that uh, that's needed to be dedicated to, to that? I'll be lying to you. You know we're working under certain circumstances. You're a student. And there are things which can affect you in between. You know those things, all right? But if you say to yourself, my goal, I'm just talking about that. If my goal, I want to ensure that the due date of the submission of the pro of, uh, research proposal, somewhere, sometimes in September, sometimes October, I want to meet the due date. You put a timeline around that. And the reason why I'm saying that, if you don't have a timeline, 
you can realize towards the end of September, if the due date for the submission is end of October, you have not started with the research proposal. And that can delay the submission. So just put a timeline for yourself and start to work on the timeline. Because I'm a, it can take you two months, six months, and all, all to find that it take you more than a year. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a due date, which has been given by the institution, for especially those who are doing their master's and their PhD, to say by when are they supposed to submit their research proposal this year. So you must work towards that but you can wait it for uh, until forever. You need to start now and build it uh, on, on your uh, research proposal as we are talking now. So that if in, you want to read your research proposal, we are able to give feedback and all of this. So that maybe to us, the closing date and so on, the week of closing date, then you populate document online. When the supervisor agrees with you, then from there we start. So you can start to work on it now. There are a lot of research around it. And remember that, guys, and remember that um, we are there for you. As a user, you don't pay any for this workshop, right? If, for example, you want to have one-on-one -on -one with me, all right, most of the time we have it on Teams, then you tell me or you tell, you tell Mr. Sony, then Mr. Sony will, will, will always uh, in to me, then you set up a Teams meeting. If, for example, you are writing a certain section and you are not sure about it and you want us to discuss it over an hour, I'm, I'm available as long as we will be able to agree on the time and so on. All right. And the other thing, if, for example, you have already started to write a certain chapter, let's say you are writing your, your research now, your dissertation or your PhD, you have started with a certain chapter and want me to read that chapter, you can also email the chapter to me and I'll be able to read the chapter and give you feedback. And remember that, like I've said, basically, I'm not uh, replacing your supervisor, but I'm telling you guys, and I'm not saying that uh, I'm trying to sell myself. I know what the external examiners are looking for. So when I advise you, I'll advise you based on that. If I say this chapter one, I'm not happy about it, go and write it. Then you write it again, you give it to me, I give feedback, then write it for the third time. And then I say, no, no, now I think it's fine. Forward it to your supervisor, and the supervisor will see where to paint the bridge and do other stuff. All right? Because if I, I, I get the first chapter from you, then I, I say everything is fine. I'll be lying. By the time you submit your document for external examination, you're going to fail that, 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 that dissertation or thesis. And no one wants to fail, by the way. So that's why I'm saying I'm available for one of one will be online, all right. I'm also available for the workshop like we've done today, all right. So let me just put my email address there quickly. I think it's also available on the poster if I'm not mistaken, all right. Please, colleagues, if you are sending me an online document and you want me to look at, at that document, please, you must also make sure that you give me. You cannot send to me a document today and say, Doc, can you give me feedback by Monday? No. All right. I, I always take almost a week to read a student's work. If you give it to me Saturday this week, hopefully by next week, Saturday or Sunday, I'll give you feedback. It depends on the length of the document itself. So we are not supposed to rush each other, is it? All right. But basically, that's how far I can end.